So today uh, I am interviewing uh, Dr. Lisa Dai on medical ethics, and mm -hmm. it's actually a two-part series. And today we will talk about uh, autonomy and why autonomy as a concept and uh, as a phenomenon matters in uh, medicine and healthcare. So I want to just set the, the context a bit uh, for, for this interview because uh, in Cause Health, we're really interested in how different philosophical ideas and concepts influence uh, medical discourse. And that sometimes we use a concept in different ways with different meanings. And so, for instance, in Cause Health, we have talked about causality, probability, complexity, but also knowledge and evidence. But one thing we have not talked about at all is, uh, is autonomy. And this is something that you have worked on. Uh, quite a bit yeah. and the one one reason why it's interesting to look at these concepts that have different meanings is that we typically use them with just one of the meanings but then mm. so we don't really detect disagreements because I just assume when I use a concept that you use it in the same way so Lisa could you could you tell us a bit more about what autonomy is or what kind of meanings it could have yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, autonomy is a concept that became much more prominent in biomedical ethics in the sort of the later part of the 20th century. Um, as a word, it means literally self-governance. And it was a term that was actually in, um, I think it is of Greek origin, and it was used to describe city-states that were able to govern themselves rather than being governed by another power. But, um, and so then in the sort of, I mean, the very simplistic kind of story about autonomy is that in the sort of 1970s and 80s, as there was a bit of a pushback against medical paternalism and that the sort of the powers of the medical profession and the rise of research ethics and um, taking care of participants in medical research as well as individual patients and their rights in the healthcare system, um, this concept of patient autonomy became more prominent. And there's lots of different um, philosophers um, and bioethicists have written a lot about autonomy. One of the more um, prominent concepts of autonomy is um, put is part of the four principles that were put forward by Beecham and Childress in their very influential text, which is the principles of medical ethics. Um, I think I have, oh, sorry, the uh, principles of biomedical ethics. I think this is an old second edition, which I've got a hold of. I think that's from like the late 70s. So who are the um, authors? Um, Tom Beecham oh, yeah. and James okay. Childress. Yep, so one is a doctor and one is a philosopher, but they're very, very, very well known for this textbook, which has been enormously influential in medical education and in bioethics. And it's in about its, I think it's seventh or eighth edition now. Um, and so it's a, evolved a lot over time. But basically, they advocate for four central principles of biomedical ethics. So that is um, autonomy, beneficence and non-maleficence are the first three. And they came out of the Belmont report in the 1970s, which looked at um, sort of re research ethics mostly and safeguarding the rights of individual participants in medical research. Um, and then justice is the fourth principle of biomedical ethics. So the idea is that clinicians should consider all these factors, beneficence to do um, you know, to benefit the patient. Non-maleficence is um, not to do them any harm, um, considerations of justice, and then, of course, autonomy. And many people have argued that autonomy is the more prominent of these principles. And it kind of has been taken to mean broadly something similar to personal freedom. And it means, so self-determination, you think of self-governance or self-determination in the medical decision-making context. So it's that idea that patients should be able to make decisions that re as regard, um, sort of that regard their own health. But the concept has sort of been fleshed out and developed more in um, over the ensuing decades. And that's reflected in their text, but also in the literature around it. Um, so a couple of the things that I think are quite interesting about autonomy, it can be described as a um, property of concept, uh, of, sorry, a property of choices or decisions that are made. So whether a decision has been made autonomously or not, but it's also a property of people. So you can describe a person as being autonomous or not autonomous. 
And then as the um, feminist bioethics literature got involved in the concept of autonomy, they um, that sort of broadened out into um, sort of came up with this notion of relational autonomy. And that's the idea that a person's social and relational context of their life. So that includes their, you know, their social relationships, their family, um, their things like their employment and their housing situation, all the different contextual factors all affect a person's capacity to be autonomous and the ways that they can exercise their autonomy. Um, and then there are other, another aspect of autonomy is um, the relationship it has with the kinds of desires and preferences that we have. So um, there are various sort of procedural accounts of autonomy. The, some of the more prominent ones are um, Dworkin and Frankfurt, who had this kind of idea of um, we have these um, sort of goals and preferences for the kind of life that we want to live that are sort of authentic held by us based on a process of reflection on what we value and then we also have these kind of impulsive desires um, which might be more fleeting and they sometimes don't align with our preferences for the kind of life that we want to have so the classic examples are things like somebody wants to live a long and healthy life but they also enjoy eating unhealthy food and they're not really so keen on exercising so their short-term choices which are more sort of their impulsive desires they are thwarting their um the sort of goals for the life they want to have so in that way, people's choices can sometimes act against their autonomy, which is their sort of perhaps associated with the um, more reflective goals for the kind of life that they want to have. So that's uh, that's actually um, uh, connected to the idea of free will. That if you uh, if you have addiction, for instance, you're less free because uh, you cannot make these higher level decisions about okay, so I shouldn't yeah. smoke or I shouldn't eat sugar. <laughs> Yep, uh, you just have to, yeah. Yeah, and the, um, there is this kind of a legal component to autonomy because if somebody has is deemed not to have capacity to make their own decisions, then they'll have a um, substitute decision maker appointed for them in most legal systems. But um, I really um, am not a fan of the idea that autonomy is something that you either have or you don't have. And I think many most... Um, people who've thought about it very much now would agree it's a kind of a scalar concept so we can be more autonomous and less autonomous and our capacity to be autonomous or to exercise our, auton our autonomy it can vary over time and it also varies a lot according to context and the situation that we're in oh, and often that is music are, to my ears because the, yeah. way that, uh, the way that we think about dispositions is that yeah. Yeah, there, there are these tendencies that come in degree and that mm. those will change. And of course, you can have very strong, uh, a very strong disposition, but there could also be contextual factors that hinders it. So yeah, I mean, mm. I have a strong disposition to breathe. But of mm. course, if someone strangles me, that, <laughs> yeah. that's not going to be very strong, but it's, an, you know, it's impaired. So it's not something that, uh, but yeah, I could also have problems breathing. So as mm. a condition, and then I would have it. So yeah, I, I guess this autonomy, that freedom also comes in degrees and autonomy mm. comes in degrees. So I was thinking when, when you have this, because those were so many different ways to think about the concept of autonomy. Mm. Uh, is there any, uh, is there any uh, situation where the, that disagreement or different conclusions are drawn uh, in the medical context because people use uh, or have in mind different concepts of autonomy, that they disagree over autonomy because they actually use different concepts. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if you interpret autonomy as um, sort of more or less freedom, and so you as a clinician think that what it means is that a patient should be able to choose whether or not they participate in treatment, whether they want this treatment or that treatment, um, and really to direct their own medical care under guidance. But um, And so when you have situations where somebody's choices, for whatever reason, are not acting in their own best interests, um, so if someone is refusing treatment, um, and there's lots of reasons why people's autonomy can be diminished, particularly in the healthcare setting. So often when people have difficult or complicated, especially when they have complex medical decisions to make, they, are, they might 
they're feeling unwell, they might be in a lot of pain, they might be confused and scared. Um, there's a lot of reason that they're maybe not at home, they feel out of, uh, you know, a lot of people are uncomfortable in hospitals. So their capacity to sort of think rationally through and reflect on what does the what, what are the implications of this decision in the context of my goals for my life and what kind of life I want to live? Um, and so respecting a pa patient's wishes when they say, I just want to go home, let me out of here, I don't want your treatment. Um, if you go, oh, well, that uh, respecting patient autonomy means that I have to do that. Um, you could also think of it, I can see that this patient is not acting actually acting in their own best interests. And I'm sure that if I have a conversation with them about what are their goals, what do they want out of this situation? How do they want to come out of this situation? The consequences, they might not understand properly the consequences of leaving the hospital right now. Um, so there's lots of ways I think if clinicians can pay attention to how can I foster people's autonomy? How can I make my patients more capable of directing their lives in a way that is consistent with their own sort of deeply and authentically held values and goals. So that would be, um, so then you would want to, for instance, empower the patient and give mm. them the necessary information so they can make an informed choice about their mm. own treatment. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and informed choice and giving information is a really big part of how we think about autonomy as well, because um, in certain more on the procedural side of healthcare settings, um, autonomy is very closely tied up with the informed consent process. And often there's a form for this and you have to go through the form and there's a tendency to think, oh, if I've gone through the form and I've given the patient all the information, then I've looked after the patient's autonomy, I've checked that box and I can move on now to making sure I don't mm -hmm. harm them unduly and so on. So, and that is, and I have never met a clinician who actually thinks like that. I think that clin practicing clinicians are very reflective and they don't find that that reflects their practice at all. But I think what we can do as philosophers and medical ethicists is to um, provide a language for what clinicians are actually doing and how and why they are having those conversations with their patients and adapting the way that they do informed consent even for different patients. Because different people will have preferences different kinds of preferences for the amount of information that they want. Some people will want all the detail and some people won't want any, they will just want to follow the um, advice of a highly qualified medical professional. So um, sort of being responsive to the patient's preferences and the way that they want to engage with their medical decision-making is another way of supporting patient's autonomy in that context. So it seems like um, autonomy and authority, <laughs> if, if you think of the clinician as having a lot of authority, then you're, you, you wouldn't want to like exercise your autonomy, uh, like going against the advice of the clinician, for instance. Mm. I mean, you, you would question your own autonomy. And I think this is, so what is, what is interesting here is that you talk a lot about the patient's autonomy. Mm. And in, in uh, core cells, we're very interested in the clinician's uh, autonomy because it's something that has been, um, well, I would say almost threatened uh, in the mm -hmm. evidence-based uh, medicine context where um, you should follow guidelines. And mm -hmm. depending on where you work, the guidelines are interpreted more or less strict so that mm. uh, it really narrows uh, the kind of uh, uh, range of, um, of uh, treatments that you could uh, choose between. But when you sit there yeah. with the patient and you have all the information and you hear about one thing is their preferences, but another is their medical history and their context, which things have worked for them or not, then the mm -hmm. clinician's autonomy would normally be as an expert with the kind mm -hmm. of clinical knowledge and uh, that unique setting, knowledge about that unique setting, would be able to use their judgment to make a good mm -hmm. decision informed yeah. by the evidence. But if you yeah. say that the decision should be generated by the evidence, then suddenly your autonomy as a clinician is not, I mean, it's so much smaller. So what does it mean? Um, so that kind of autonomy, what, what kind of concept of autonomy are we actually interested in there? 
Well, I think, again, it's about being reflective about the kind of goals that you have for the medical decision-making process. And I guess in that kind of situation, the clinician would share the goals of the patient and they would be responsive to the values and preferences expressed by the patient. And, And it might be responding also to things like say that a patient lives alone and they don't have a social support network in the area where they live, then you're not going to send them home with a particular kind of treatment that is going to be difficult for them to administer on their own. Um, So then you might adapt your treatment. You might do something else which is going to be easier for them to handle or you're going to um, maybe keep them in an inpatient setting for longer, um, something like that. So, But it's about looking at the whole of the, like you say, looking at the whole of the patient and the patient's lives and exercising that judgment to, um, but it's about pursuing like a pursuit of a particular goal, um, which is aligned with what the patient actually wants and what the clinician is trying to achieve. Which yeah, probably because kind of, yeah. if we say that the, the patient should receive the best available care, then Mm -hmm. you could interpret that as the best available care supported by randomized control trials and the available evidence, or you could say it's the best available care for this unique patient when Mm -hmm. we consider the whole contextual uh, uh, setting. And the guidelines won't be able to make that decision because they haven't met this patient. That's right. I mean, the, obviously the evidence base will come into it and it will inform that decision making. But you'll look also at the, the like you say, the whole, the whole patient and their context and, and the reality of their life and what they actually want to achieve from that, um, I guess, that healthcare encounter. Yeah, so it, it seems to me that this um, concept of uh, autonomy, I mean, when you have the patient autonomy, you have the clinician's autonomy, and you have these relational aspects, and then you have the mm-hmm. uh, informative, <laughs> you know, how much information do you have? How much knowledge do you have? Um, what kind of knowledge is relevant in this context? And, mm. and then you come with the extra layer, layer which, which is the values. I mean, you might say that the best, the best care is to... Uh, something that would prolong someone's life while someone might say it's it's about the quality of life yeah yeah so 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 that's also the value it's about what you value and what what is important in the life of that patient Hmm. yeah well i think that we have uh, (laughs) we have covered a lot (laughs) and (laughs) we might take up some of these things in our part two yeah it's great Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. It's been uh, really interesting talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay.